Hello, I'm Richard Young, your host with Facundo Batista and Lena Feyen for MIT's course on COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 and the pandemic. The purpose of this course is to learn what we know today about the virus and the pandemic from the world's top scientists. To understand a new human virus, scientists first look to their collective knowledge of other viruses and identify those that are related and might give us clues to the life cycle of the new virus. We also look to the world's top scientific leaders. These are people who have more than deep knowledge. They are very talented problem solvers. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing you to one of the world's top scientific leaders, a scientific Sherlock Holmes, Dr. David Baltimore. Dr. Baltimore is a professor of biology at the California Institute of Technology. His professional career started as a graduate student here at MIT and with research on an RNA virus. He served as president of both Rockefeller University and the California Institute of Technology and was the founding director of the Whitehead Institute. He has made major contributions to our understanding of cancer, AIDS, and the human body's immune response. Dr. Baltimore was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 1975 for his research into the life cycle of retroviruses. He received the National Medal of Science in 1999 for his seminal contributions. Dr. Baltimore has played an important role in the development of American biotechnology. He has profoundly influenced national science policies on such issues as the AIDS epidemic and research in genetic engineering. And he has mentored a new generation of scientific leaders throughout the world. David, thank you for joining us. It, it is a pleasure um, to join my ex-colleagues at MIT in presenting this course. I have a great love for viruses because when I first came to graduate school in 1960, and that was coming to MIT, uh, I started studying viruses because my elders um, had been working on viruses of bacteria for many, many years. And the fundaments of molecular biology, which were coming together, depended very much on the study of viruses. And I never lost that focus, although I switched my own interest to animal viruses. Uh, I didn't imagine that at the end of my career, which is now, uh, I have closed my laboratory, uh, that a virus would rule the world, creating a global pandemic of a sort that we haven't seen since the flu pandemic of about a century ago. As Rick said, in 1975, I was awarded the Nobel Prize for work in virology. And at that time, I considered myself very lucky. And I wrote about my luck. And this was the opening paragraph. Um, just a second here, there's something. Yeah, good. Uh, more or less. This, I wrote that the study of biology is partly an exercise in natural aesthetics. We derive much of our pleasure as biologists from the continuing realization of how economical, elegant, and intelligent are the accidents of evolution that have been maintained by selection. A virologist is among the luckiest of biologists because he can see into his chosen pet down to the details of all of its molecules. Virologist sees how an extreme parasite functions using just the most fundamental aspects of biological behavior. So this series of talks began with Bruce Walker talking about the disease mostly and uh, Rick Lausinger talking about the biology of coronaviruses I thought I would step back and give some idea of the variety of viruses from which coronaviruses emerged. The living world consists of 
single cell organisms and multicellular organisms of plants and animals of cold blooded and warm blooded animals of many other divisions of this sort. But layered on top of all of that is a separate world of tiny creatures, viruses, that seem to have evolved from bits and pieces of the living world. Viruses used to be defined as simply filterable biological agents, filterable through filters that hold back bacteria or anything larger. So they were very tiny. And when we had isolated a number of these viruses, we found that they used either RNA or DNA as their genetic material, even though we as part of the biological world use only DNA to store our genetic information, as do all other organisms, except viruses. And the majority of the smallest viruses use RNA as their genetic material, and so study of them uh, is very rewarding. Larger viruses often use DNA. There is no accepted definition of a virus. My own definition is that they are tiny objects consisting of a pro protected nucleic acid core that lack ribosomes or energy generation and can duplicate themselves only by penetrating living cells and diverting some or all of the cell's macromolecular synthesis towards making more viruses. Does that make them alive? I'll leave that to your imagination because there certainly is no agreement on the, the answer to that question. When I say viruses are tiny, this gives you an idea of their size. Uh, polio virus, a very small virus, flu and herpes, larger viruses, and then now a class of megaviruses, viruses with huge genomes. They're all around the size of transport vesicles inside cells. They're a little bigger than ribosomes in general. Um, and they uh, contain, they carry out all of their activities from this very small beginning. How many viruses are there? There's an uncountable number of viruses because every organism on earth or virtually every organism has viruses that associate themselves with that organism. Uh, there are now defined some 1500 species of viruses, but there are many more than that that haven't been characterized. We have some tens of fundamentally different families of viruses so different that they will have evolved separately. And they're all parasites. They all grow uh, only inside living cells. How did they evolve? Well, the simplest of viruses are just a few genes, five, 10 genes, wrapped up in a protective coat. So, the genes are simply insufficient to allow the virus to multiply on its own. All it has to do, though, is get inside a cell. And in the cell, it finds this range of uh, biology that it can subvert to its own ends. Uh, what viral genes do do is encode the information for the duplication of the genome of a virus and for the production of that protective code. They also, even the smallest viruses, inhibit cellular functions and counter the defenses that cells have put up against viruses. Where do those virus genes come from? They come from two places. One is genes found in other organisms, and that's where most of them come from. The key genes are those that encode proteins that can duplicate the RNA or DNA of the virus. And 
those genes are, are related, not closely, but, but recognizably, to similar genes in plants and animals. So they must be inherited from the cellular world, although they may have been inherited at a very early stage, that period when there weren't yet cells, the pre-cellular world, about which we don't know a whole lot. There are also genes that arise from the horizontal transfer from other viruses. The viruses are sharing genes continually. And there are genes with no known relatives. Presumably they evolve in the virus itself. And they carry out important functions. Every time we find a new virus, we run the possibility of finding some genes that we've never seen before. And that makes virologists happy because it gives us a lot of work. What I'm talking about is described in a remarkable paper by Eugene Coonan and company, uh, the reference for which is on the slide. For anybody who wants to delve into this world of viruses in what I must say is a complicated and challenging paper. Now, how do viruses multiply? They get into the cell. Some of them get into the nucleus of the cell. Others stay in the cytoplasm. Uh, they commandeer cellular machinery. Uh, if you do an siRNA screen using inhibitory techniques, uh, you can show that hundreds of host cell genes are important to the multiplication of a virus. And as you would think, small viruses are very dependent and larger ones do some things for themselves. But none of the viruses, almost by definition, make either the proteins that generate energy or the proteins involved in protein synthesis itself. Those come entirely from cells. Viruses can multiply very quickly. Some increase a thousand fold in six hours and the viruses that grow in bacteria can multiply themselves uh, maybe a hundred fold in, in 20 minutes. Uh, they can continue to live only if they're passed from one host organism to the next, which means that viruses have to continually find new host organisms uh, that have not experienced the virus, because once a host has experienced the virus, it, it is likely to be immune to further uh, infection from that virus. Many viruses are very tightly tied to particular species, uh, many tied to humans, like smallpox or polio or mumps or measles. And those viruses can be eradicated entirely from the earth because they have only one host. And so if you ring that host with protection, you can uh, get rid of the virus. And in fact, smallpox is today not known to be spreading anywhere in the, in the world. And polio is close to that, although the end game of getting rid of polio is not going very well. Now, occasionally viruses will jump from one species of, of host to another species. When they come into the human world, we say they have emerged. Uh, what we really mean is that we didn't think about them before. And once they came to infect us, they become very important to us. For a virus, emerging gives it a wider range of hosts and that may be beneficial to its continued existence. This is what it looks like inside a cell. There are all of these various pathways. And if you could see, and you can't really on this slide, uh, there are little black dots in places where the HIV virus fits itself into the action of particular cellular processes. 
And those are for HIV, either in the nucleus or the cytoplasm. These emerging viruses are the viruses that scare us most because when they exist in the wild in their usual host, they may not be very virulent, but when they infect humans, they may turn out to be extremely virulent. Um, and almost every year, there's a virus that emerges from the wild to infect domesticated animals or humans, and then spreads uh, to other um, species, uh, are, are the members of the species. You don't even hear about these. I, I love to talk about a virus called Schmallenberg virus uh, because virtually nobody's ever heard of it. Um, in this little German town, it, it became known in 2011 and it produced the death and, and def deformation of of sheep and goats and cows. Um, it was probably being spread by a vector like a fly or a flea. It wasn't evident in the world at all in 2010. By 2011, 1,400 farms had it. And then it burned itself out and hasn't been seen since. I just Googled it to make sure something hadn't happened and I, I can't find any reference to it now. This shows you um, what, uh, is, what is uh, lurking out there in the world. So an emerging virus can be the causative agent of, of what then is a new and re un previously unrecognized human infection. Uh, and viruses uh, often the, the emerge, sorry, the, often the emerging viruses are ones that are transmitted by arthropods, ticks, mosquitoes, midges. Uh, they may be a dead end, as Smallenberg virus seems to have been, or they may evolve into a stable relationship with a new host. And that's clearly what happens with flu virus uh, that can come in from uh, birds and, and uh, maintain then a stable relationship with humans. The ones that we care about most are HIV, because I'm going to talk about that one a lot, and SARS-CoV-2, coronavirus, which of course is the virus of the moment. Those happen to be viruses that don't have a vector. They are spread as virus from human to human or from animal to animal. Let's focus on them. Uh, but I, I still want to make one or, one or two other points. One is that viruses are ubiquitous. There are viruses of all of the organisms in the, in the oceans. Uh, there are viruses on land. Um, and if you try to count them up, and some people have done that, it's, it's a difficult exercise. The number of virus particles on the earth probably outnumbers the number of cells on the earth and in all of the organisms on the earth, uh, perhaps by tenfold and maybe more. And they occupy every environmental niche. Uh, the amount of viruses in the ocean is astounding. Uh, they have a, an incredible biodiversity because they have, they use all of these various genes. Um, and they have a very great range of morphologies. Wonderful to look at pictures, but I'm not going to show pictures. Um, and we think that they could well continue to live even in the face of the environmental change that we're all experiencing today. Now, Darwinian evolution is about the competition for environmental niches. And all organisms are fighting with each other for these niches, except viruses. 
viruses, because they live at such a different lifestyle, are not in competition with each other. They're in competition with the host immune system. So they don't even do a lot of genetic recombination. And you might say, well, how do they purify their genomes without genetic recomb recombination? Because as, as Herman Muller in Muller's rat, called Muller's ratchet, showed years ago, if you don't have genetic recombination, there's an accumulation of mut mutations uh, in non-recombining organisms that should kill them, should, should wipe them out. Um, and yet that doesn't happen to viruses because their numbers are so large and because they actually generate a lot of, of, of uh, genetic variety just by having error-prone polymerases. In, oddly enough, the coronavirus um, does more recombination than others, and recombination may play much more of a role in those viruses. Now, the genomes of viruses are a swarm. They're not a, just one particular genome. Uh, and that's because the viruses do mutate so re readily that even in just growing up inside one host organism, the virus generates an enormous heterogeneity uh, of genes, of gene structures. And it enables the virus uh, to elude immune attack, to bind to multiple receptors, not just one receptor, to adapt to different cells in the, in the host organism. Uh, we don't know fully what viruses do with their tremendous heterogeneity. Uh, but it is important to remember that they're not pure genetic units. Viruses were discovered just at the end of the 19th century. And they were discovered by being filterable, by being able to go through filters that held back all of the other organisms that were being discovered at that time as disease-causing agents, uh, which were bacteria. Uh, in about 10 years later, viruses were found to cause cancers. And the history of cancer research is very much a history of virus-induced cancers. Uh, it was in 1917 that someone figured out how to demonstrate that a single particle was growing on a petri dish of, of bacteria, uh, a single viral particle. Uh, and that showed that viruses could replicate uh, and opened up the physiology of viruses to study. In the 1930s, the first electron microscopes were invented and the, what people focused on were viruses because they were just the right size to be interesting. Um, and in fact, we first saw viruses in the 1930s. Um, it was not until the 1950s that we realized that there could be RNA viruses as well as DNA viruses. So in 1970, I'd spent about 10 years at that point uh, as an investigator of the molecular biology of, of RNA viruses. And I realized that they fell into a pattern. Uh, and it was all built around the central dogma. So the central dogma of molecular biology, as we all know, is that DNA can duplicate itself. It can be the template for making RNA and that the RNA can be the template for determining the structure of proteins. And then in 1970, in fact, uh, I and, and Howard Timmon discovered that one of those arrows can go back the other way. That is, RNA can be a template for making DNA. And so there is a movement of genetic information from RNA back to DNA and from DNA the RNA. Uh, once we knew that, it was possible to classify all viruses 
within that structure. So they could have a single strand of DNA. Let's see, I can show that. A single strand of DNA as their genetic information, a single strand of RNA as their genetic information. That single strand can be the plus strand, the sense strand of RNA, or the complementary strand, which has no sense in the sense that it, it can't encode protein. Uh, but it can be copied into messenger RNA. Uh, and all of these kinds of nucleic acid can be copied into messenger. I, the one I didn't mention is double-stranded RNA, which is in some viruses. Um, and so with all of these possible templates, uh, the uh, messenger RNA can be made actually in seven different ways from uh, viruses. When I first realized this, I defined six kinds of viruses, and, and later there was a seventh added. Um, and we use this classification today, I'm amazed, because in 1970 when I published this, uh, I had no idea that it would uh, stay on so effectively. Uh, and it, it shows that the virus world is much more complicated in, a, in the sense of genetic systems than the uh, world of, of higher organisms, uh, something that we might not have expected. Now, what are the sizes of RNA viruses? Well, here's a whole lot of them. You can't read their names, but it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, shown uh, getting larger and larger and larger as we go from one class of viruses to another until they reach the end. Um, and actually the end um, is right here, uh, where the largest of, of, uh, the, of viral genomes can be found. Uh, these viral genomes are segmented, like flu, they have eight different segments in influenza virus. Uh, so that's uh, not a single strand of RNA except for this one virus way out here, and that's the coronavirus, uh, which is much larger than all of these others. So why is that true? It's true because the polymerases that make viruses are error prone, uh, all of them. And the RF frequency is about one in 10,000 nucleotides. So if a genome is 10,000 nucleotides long, or maybe up to 20,000 nucleotides, then the number of mutations is not so great uh, per genome, one, two mutations per genome. But if it gets any larger than that, the number of mutations gets to the point where it interferes with the effectiveness of the virus. And so a virus can't be any bigger than that without going through error correction. And the coronaviruses are the one kind of virus that has an error correction mechanism in it. Now, we in our own genomes have very effective error correction mechanisms. Our genomes get enormously larger than this uh, because we have these error correction capabilities. All right, let me go now to the, to the two scourges. Uh, the last 30 years have seen two viruses emerge uh, that have really changed the world. HIV causing AIDS and SARS-CoV-2 causing the disease called COVID-19. Uh, let's first focus on HIV. So it's what's called the lentivirus. Lenti means slow and it slowly develops symptoms. In humans, that can be over a period of years, 10 years, but there are animal lentiviruses and they're also very slow to develop their disease. And that's where lentiviruses got their name. They are retroviruses. They use reverse transcription um, because they send their genetic information from DNA to RNA 
and back to DNA and back to RNA. Uh, they grow only in one kind of blood cell. It's called the CD4 T cell or lymphocyte. And it's the only cell to which they can bind because the CD4 molecule on the surface of the cell is what they bind to. And this is a quick view of the life cycle of retroviruses, lentiviruses, and others. The particle itself shown over here uh, has large numbers of proteins in it. Uh, in fact, most of the genetic information is for proteins that are in the virus particle. It also has two copies of an RNA molecule that encodes all of these proteins. And when it binds to a cell, it puts the RNA into the cell, and the RNA is then copied into DNA by the reverse transcriptase, which is in the particle. And that copy gets into the nucleus, and the DNA incorporates itself into one of the chromosomes of the cell. It turns from an extracellular agent into a set of genes in the cell. And then it's copied like any other genes in the cell into RNA. The RNA makes protein in the cytoplasm. The proteins that are made can come together to form new particles, uh, and those bud off the surface of the cell. And so it's a complex life cycle, uh, but it's well understood. And um, in particular, the reverse transcription process is very elegant, but I won't go into how that works. I'm just going to blow up this. Actually, I've been through all of this. Now, when the viral DNA integrates into the host DNA, there are two possible outcomes. Either the genes can function to make large amounts of protein, and the protein can then form large numbers of particles, but that probably will kill the cell because it's, it's taking up all of the cell's macromolecular capability. Or the virus can only use a little bit of the capability of the cell, in which case it doesn't kill the cell. And now the virus can change the properties of the cell, and in particular can make it a cancer cell. And that's how cancer viruses, in fact, work. Uh, they go in and they uh, continually produce the products of a gene in small amounts, but sufficient amounts to turn the cell into a cancer cell. It also means that if we use our skills as genetic engineers and put in genes that we want to put into a cell, we can carry out gene therapy. And today, there are large numbers of viruses that are being modified to carry therapeutic genes into cells. And gene therapy is a very active part of, of medicine. If the viruses get into germ cells, uh, then they can be transferred to the next progeny animals or plants, uh, but it's mainly animals. Uh, and if the virus is silenced so that it doesn't uh, cause up anything like cancer, uh, it can be passed silently from one generation to the next. In fact, this has happened extensively over evolutionary time. And 8% of the human genome is retroviruses of the sort we've been talking about, uh, mostly silenced. In fact, mostly mutated to the point of being not very effective viruses anymore because they've been around so long. But the AIDS virus, the lentivirus that caused the HIV that uh, causes AIDS, uh, that's a virus that grows very rapidly into large amounts. Uh, it doesn't cause changes in cells in the, in the uh, infected person so much as it actually kills cells and produces more virus. Uh, 
Where did it come from? Well, it was first seen in the United States in the 1980s, uh, but we then learned very quickly that it was already widespread in Africa. We know that it comes from a progenitor that's found in African monkeys, uh, and they spread it to apes and other, uh, well, in particular to the ape, great apes of, of Africa. Uh, there are people who live on capturing and butchering apes, uh, and they probably got in, the they were the first ones to get infected uh, by the virus which then spread silently over decades in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, causing little bits of disease, but not enough that it was recognized as a syndrome until, I, oddly enough, it was recognized in the developed world. Um, and without treatment, this virus is almost uniformly fatal. Uh, it has been the cause now, because it spread throughout the world, of 76 million infections and 33 million deaths. And we still have no vaccine for it. And it's a disease that remains out of control. It's actually a poorly infectious virus. It needs access to the blood system where CD4 cells are to be found. And that access is by a needle, for instance, by if, if people uh, are injected by hypodermic syringes uh, or through a cut in the surface of the skin or uh, the organs, uh, but most effectively through sex. And I won't uh, give a lecture on that. Uh, HIV infection is lethal because it depletes the CD4 cells. Ultimately, the human has so few cells that they die of, of some other organ, other infection. Uh, if we look at where it's found, it's found mostly in Africa. That's why Africa is red in this map. Uh, but the other place where it's extensive is in uh, the Americas. Uh, North America uh, in particular, but actually in in areas of South America too. Um, it, it is found at some level all over the world. Um, now, let, let's talk about SARS because that's what brings us here. Um, this, which is severe acute respiratory syndrome, was first found as a disease called SARS uh, in the early 2000s in China. It was a disease that spread very quickly, it's very infectious, uh, and it got into travelers and the travelers took it to other places around the world. Uh, it started probably in, in food markets in, in Guangdong, China, uh, and it was rapidly recognized as being about 10% fatal and therefore something that had to be treated very seriously. And it was treated by, by isolation of cases. And in, this was extremely effective uh, because the virus was so obvious in its effects on, on humans. Uh, and although it did spread to 37 countries, it only infected about 8,000 people over the time when it was active, which was just a couple of years. Um, and when we went back to look for where it came from, it almost certainly came from bats, uh, but it spread easily to other animals, to other mammals. Um, and uh, amazingly, uh, because of the isolation techniques that were used has not been seen again in humans since 2004. But we should know that it's lurking out there in the natural world. And of course, it's just a model for what many other viruses can do. Um, it's, it's worth remembering how it spread. 
it was a doctor who treated patients in Guangdong, who traveled then to Hong Kong, stayed in a hotel, got sick from the virus he'd picked up in Guangdong, was taken to a hospital and died the next day. But it was guests in the hotel that began to spread the virus out to other parts of Asia and even to Canada. Uh, it never really took hold in the United States. And finally, there were only this small number of cases in many countries with a fatality of um, 10% in each case. Uh, but the isolate, isolating the individual cases, keeping them in separate parts of hospitals, keeping them away from other people, uh, allowed uh, the virus to be, to burn itself out. Um, the virus that caused it is a coronavirus, as we've been saying, and as you all know, uh, it's the biggest of all RNA viruses. Uh, and there are many other coronaviruses. There are coronaviruses that infect humans, uh, and there are coronaviruses that infect uh, animals. Uh, this is a picture of what one looks like in the electron microscope, and this is the kind of picture that's being distributed around the world uh, that uh, reminds us of the very big spikes on the outside of the virus. This virus has a very simple life cycle. Uh, it binds to a surface receptor, uh, the, the virus that causes um, a car, this, uh, the, the COVID-2 virus binds to a protein called ACE2. That enables it to get into the cell. In the cell, the RNA duplicates itself, uh, makes protein, the proteins combine, to form virus particles and it's released. Um, a quite simple life cycle, very similar to poliovirus and other um, RNA viruses, except in having more genetic information and more proteins. The, vi the human coronaviruses consist of four common cold viruses, viruses that spread around every year causing mild symptoms, mild disease, uh, and, and something that doesn't bother us a whole lot. It's like the, what we call the common cold virus, uh, which is actually a, a, a coronavirus. And then three very virulent coronaviruses. One, the one that was stopped at 8,000 cases. The second, MERS, found in camels, which is actually causes more like 30% lethality in humans uh, because it gets into the lower lung very effectively using a different receptor. And then SARS-CoV-2, which is the present pandemic virus, uh, actually poorly lethal, uh, lethal at the level of maybe 1%. Um, but for that very reason, very hard to isolate and stop because we don't, it, it, it causes uh, mild symptoms in most people uh, and it's not recognized as a serious disease until it's too late. Now, why are these viruses different from one another? Why is one coronavirus cause one level of lethality, the other another level? We don't really understand this today. And there's a lot of people trying to understand it. But the problem is that we don't have good animal models that allow us to model these viruses and to understand their behavior. The life cycle of coronaviruses only takes a few hours. And so once one cell is infected, it spreads to other cells pretty quickly. Um, and it only takes a few days from the time you get one particle infecting you until uh, you have many, many particles, mostly in the respiratory system, uh, mostly getting into the upper levels of the lungs uh, where 
you're sick, but not uh, mortally sick. Um, one of the aspects of this virus is that it uh, affects older people much more seriously than it affects children. And in fact, the common cold coronaviruses only infect children in general because by the time adults have grown up, they've already gotten the virus and are immune to it. Uh, it may be that that's why, and maybe the only reason why COVID-2 is such a serious virus is that when it appeared in our world, uh, we were all susceptible to it. And so it affects older people and causes a very serious disease in older people. Uh, that virus has spread all around the world. Uh, this map is notable for the lighter colors in Africa. It's something which I must say, I didn't realize until I saw this map that the virus does not spread very widely in Africa, except way down at the tip of Africa, uh, which is the, the country of South Africa, uh, the most highly developed country in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and the virus has taken hold there pretty effectively. Um, we know that the virus is continually multiplying, having affected, infected about 30 million people worldwide, killed about a million people worldwide. Um, and, uh, but, but these curves are going up continually uh, because it's still spreading at an absolutely horrifying rate. So the recent pandemics due to emerging viruses have produced 76 million cases of AIDS, 30 million cases of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, SARS-1 was stopped in its tracks, uh, but it lurks out there. And the big question is, first of all, are we gonna control SARS-CoV-2 by vaccination, or is it gonna just spread through the world uh, infecting people until it becomes a, an equilibrium part of our um, world? And an even scarier question, what virus will be next? Because as I said, there are maybe 1,500 different viruses out there, any one of which could spread in, in humans. Um, and in fact, there are even more than that. With that, let me thank you for your attention uh, and answer whatever questions I can answer. Thank you, David. Uh, Mir wants to know how frequently do co-infecting viruses recombine? For example, could SARS-CoV-2 recombine with seasonal flu? Uh, there is, to my knowledge, no example of viruses from different families like that recombining with each other. Presumably it happens at some low level because uh, as I said, there's horizontal gene transfer among viruses. Um, and so somehow they must uh, recombine, but it's, it's not at a, 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 an available level for study. Um, but if there are two viruses of the same family, then they can recombine, and they do recombine, not at a very high level, but, but at a, a perceptible level. And you know, we're isolating, for instance, lots and lots of strains of poliovirus because we're trying to eradicate poliovirus. At the same time, uh, we can see that there are hybrid polioviruses. Uh, there are three kinds of polio, type one, type two, and type three and you get some hybrid viruses forming. So there clearly is recombination. Uh, but uh, it doesn't seem to play a large role in the disease 
uh, causing capabilities of, of these viruses. Um, although, as I said, coronaviruses are an exception to that in that they recombine fairly frequently uh, if two viruses from among the seven that I talked about get into the same cell. And uh, Dennis is asking, are there advantages that RNA gives viruses over DNA? I've asked that question to myself often, and I don't know the answer. Um, <laughs> I, uh, you know, it's, it's very hard to, to uh, question evolution. Uh, we're given the world that we have, and we as biologists go and try to study it. Uh, but we never ask, why is there a giraffe? Why is there a pangolin? Um, and what other things don't we ever see? Like something with scales like a pangolin, but a neck like a giraffe. Well, here's a question I think you know the answer to. <laughs> Hannah wants to know, why are bats so common reservoirs for viruses that can infect humans? Uh, the answer seems to be that bats uh, can harbor viruses without the viruses causing severe disease in the bat. Uh, and the reason for that is argued. I, I don't want to, I'm not sure I believe it. Mm -hmm. um, so, vi but, but bats therefore are very good reservoirs uh, for viruses because of their ability to fight off the, the disease-causing ability of the virus. And then, then they can spread uh, from the caves where bats hang out um, to the rest of the world. Uh, what surprises me, actually, is that there isn't more transmission of viruses from bats. Because every night, as far as I know, Bats go out and fly around, um, and they presumably leave behind uh, their feces full of virus. Uh, but uh, in fact, it's pretty rare for a virus to emerge from bats. To, to what extent did the virology community anticipate a pandemic like this to emerge among the coronaviruses? I don't think that we imagined it among, among coronaviruses, but we certainly have imagined that this would happen from some virus. It was actually thought that flu was the most likely virus to cause a, a new pandemic. Um, and coronaviruses were, uh, up until the first SARS epidemic, um, Coronaviruses were a, a, a generally minor part of the concern of virologists. Do you, um, and there's a student, Savannah, would like to know, would like you to please go a little further into the idea of double-stranded RNA. Oh, well, double-stranded RNA is like double-stranded DNA. Uh, the bases uh, in one strand form hydrogen bonds with the bases in the other strand, and that pattern is transmitted from one strand to the other, to the other strand. And so those two strands uh, have a very strong affinity for each other, uh, and uh, that can be RNA or it could be DNA. Um, and in, in the class of viruses that have double-stranded RNA as their genomes, they've taken advantage of this uh, very strong affinity of the two strands for each other uh, to make that the genome, uh, just like we have double-stranded DNA as our genome. Uh, one more. Yeah, uh, I can go into more, but. One more question for you, David. Do you have any insight into what factors cause the differences in lethality between the various coronaviruses? Well, no, I don't. Um, and so I said, when, when I was thinking about this for this talk, I uh, 
sent a letter of email to a woman I consider to be one of the best people in the understanding of the natural history of coronaviruses, Emmy DeWitt, uh, who is at uh, the uh, laboratory in Hamilton, Montana. Uh, the, the, it's mostly a virus laboratory. Um, and I asked her, does she have any idea why these different viruses um, differ so much in their lethality? Uh, and in particular, what, you know, what's with the MERS virus, uh, which is so very lethal? And she wrote back to me, she said, I have no idea. She said, they, they look so very similar to one another. She said, I suspect that COVID-2 uh, is really not a whole lot different than the non-virulent coronaviruses. And the real difference is that it attacked humans when we had no protection. Whereas we have generally had very good protection against the common cold coronaviruses. And that it isn't a matter of some gene in the virus for lethality. It's our experience. It's our experience. And it, it's sort of, it may even be bad luck that one person uh, is so very affected and another isn't. David, thank you very much for sharing your knowledge today. My pleasure.